Hi, welcome to Career Paths and Social Awareness for the Dancer. This is our next career in dance, which is about being a commercial performing artist. Now, there's a lot that are encompassed in the idea of being a commercial performing artist. It could mean that one is dancing in music videos or um, in a commercial setting, as in commercials that you would see on the TV or YouTube or Facebook or anywhere that commercials come up. Um, it also might mean that one who is dancing on film in terms of any time that you see dance in, in films. It could also mean one who is dancing with a tour. Uh, frequently the tour itself is for a music artist and they're a backup dancer. That may be something that you are looking at when you are looking at a being a commercial dancer. It also can be a theme park performer or a cruise ship performer. A lot of times that these are kind of encompassed in the commercial aspect. And I'm not really going to focus too much on theme parks or cruise ships because in our next webinar, that's what we're going to um, focus on and think about in terms of being a theme park performer or choreographer. So we will be thinking about finding a way that you're talking about within commercials or music videos or on tour for a performing a music performing artist. So while it is not essential to have a college degree for being a commercial performing artist, the more education you have, the better off you are going to be as a performing artist. So especially um, thinking about when you're getting your career started or when you're moving along with what you're doing as a commercial performing artist, really one of the most essential requirements to being a commercial artist is having versatility. So one of the things that's really great about being in a college setting is that you're able to expose yourself to maybe other varieties of movement that you haven't necessarily explored in your previous education. So that may be one thing you wanna consider. Also, the more people that you know, the better off you will be in getting more work. So that's one thing to consider. So one of the things you want to really think about is the requirements for being a commercial performing artist is much more about being versatile. You might want to have like a special thing that's like the thing you do really well um, so that that can kind of shine a light on you. But you also want to be very versatile in a lot of different styles of dance um, and having both a niche and being able to articulate your movement style through other styles. Another requirement is networking. So you need to be very good at talking to other people, making connections, having um, good rapport with people. When we talk about networking, if you put off someone or someone is putting you off, it's likely that that may break a connection or break something within your networking. So you want to make sure that you're, you're, you're thinking about how you are interacting and that whenever you're working or whenever you're going to auditions, that you're being very professional in the way that you are handling yourself and remembering that your job doesn't start when you audition or when you're actually on the job, but you're starting your professional attitude when you get out of your car in or whatever your transportation is. Um, to, to actually fulfill whatever that moment is that you're going to audition or rehearsal or the actual gig itself. Another requirement and something that my guest really emphasized in, especially in terms of in this day and age, is she felt like it was a very important um, requirement to be good at branding or marketing yourself. Um, and I, I feel when, if through my research as well and talking with other people, that's a really important aspect of being a commercial performing artist. Now, especially with social media being so dominant and being almost one of the forms that you can use as here's my portfolio, is you wanna be thinking that 
you're not just putting every single thing out onto your social media platforms. You're being very selective about what you are marketing yourself as. And you want to be thinking, what is your brand? What are you bringing to your work? And that's something that you may want to even take a class in or spend some extra education um, on making sure that you really understand how to brand yourself, how to continue that brand, and how to really um, propel yourself forward in a way that you want to show your own personal self. One other thing I wanted to highlight from what our guest talked about was she talked about that you don't have to always do everything. So that's a really great idea, especially as a, as a young performing artist. It's highly possible that you think every audition I go to, if I get it, I've got to take it. And I, I've got to make sure that if they need a little crop top, but I really don't want to do that, I have to do it because that's what's required. Our guest really talked about that one thing that she has learned is that you, you want to think about what that branding is. And if an un, if an audition has a requirement that makes you uncomfortable, then remove yourself or think about it before you go to the audition. Is this something I really want to do? Is this something that is up my alley? And um, just be thoughtful and considerate about what kind of jobs you're taking. You don't need to take everything. You can work even if you say no. A couple of other requirements for being a commercial performing artist, and actually generally a lot of these are, be, are really important for performing artists in general, whether it's a commercial or um, any other kind of form, is you want a current headshot. And that means that if you decide to change your hair color, you have you need to have a hair color headshot. <laughs> um, so you want to keep focused on that. You want to keep and make sure that it's all up to date. What you have on your headshot should represent you when you go into an audition for a job. You also need to have a resume. You want to be thoughtful about what your resume has on it. And also, it's good to have a dance reel. A dance reel meaning something that showcases your performing, um, some amount of excerpts from or pieces of things that you have done. The more variety you can do, the better. But when you're also putting together your reel, you want to be thinking about you're not necessarily cutting and pasting the music as well. You want to be thinking you're showing off your dancing. So you may want to find one piece of music that goes over the whole thing. It's also possible to feature it on your resume or on your dance reel when you're submitting that, you can put your handle for your social media. This is a way of making it be something that's there. But the more professional you can be um, of having your own dance reel is really, um, really important. While it is not essential or even necessarily required, you may want to consider being represented by an agency. One of the things about an agency that is you want to be thinking about is that they work with you. It's not that they just are the ones who are going to find the information and you do whatever they tell you. So you do want to find that if you are, if you decide that an agency is a great idea for you, you want to remember that you're helping them find work for you, but you are also helping. It needs to be much more of a, of a connection than it is you're kind of waiting for them to find the information for you. So I put together some um, very popular commercial agencies in both Los Angeles and New York. Some of them are bi-coastal, and so they are actually represented in both places. One of the things that is possibly a good thing to consider is that these are very popular ones. So they're big agencies, but if you can find a smaller agency, that may be a better choice for you if you're looking at agencies in general. The reason you would think about that is they have a specific type and a specific look that they're going to be sending people out for. 
And if it's a huge agency, they're going to have a lot of people to choose from. They may not send every single one of their clients. But if it's a smaller agency, they may, you may find that they're, they're calling you out on jobs more frequently. But one of the things I want to impress upon is that I definitely was told it is not necessary to have an agency. And especially now, almost a better way of figuring out who you want to work for, where the auditions are, is more so taking master classes with the choreographers that you're interested in. So when you're going to going to auditions, that's a good time when you're networking to find out who is having a master class. Where are those master classes? Will they be looking at people in those master classes? And that's a very frequent way that the choreographers are kind of getting a feel for dancers, as well as you can get a better feel for, you know, I really love this choreographer. I'd like to work with them again. Or this one didn't quite work for me. It's not really my style. So you may want to consider more than doing an agency is it's that idea of networking, really getting a sense of who you're talking to, how you're getting information, and being able to have people pass along information to you and you pass along information to other people. That's really what you want to be thinking about when you are networking. So I've given some examples of salaries for the different kinds of commercial performing artists you may encounter. So film and video, you can see here. Um, many of them are union work. So SAG-AFTRA is what you're looking at in terms of the rates. And then Dancers Alliance, is, a, is they give some for non-union work as well in terms of their rates, but they also show the SAG-AFTRA um, rates as well. Cruise ships is, again, sort of a general, what maybe you could make from um, working on a cruise ship. Just briefly, in terms of cruise ship work, you're likely to be hired for um, one or more cruise ventures, and then you are generally going to have a combination of performing as well as some other duties on the ship. So it may be that you're teaching a class in the other times when you're not performing. It may be that you're helping with ship things that are happening, activities, bingo, or um, entertainment things, hosting. So there, there's going to be some other duties that you will have as a performing artist when you're on a ship. But the nice thing about being on a cruise ship is generally you can save most of the money that you are making in your salary because the room and board is paid for and some amount of the meals. When you go off the ship, that's the only time that you're really going to need to spend any money. And so for the most part, you're able to save most of the money that you are making. Another performing artist, um, Vegas shows. There are lots of different options in Vegas for both being um, a showgirl type dancer, as well as there are several um, longstanding theatrical performances that exist in Vegas. So that's again, sort of a general gauge for what you might possibly make uh, for a Vegas gig. The last one here is for a tour for a music artist. So being a background dancer, a backup dancer for um, a music artist on tour. So I wanna welcome our guest today, Christina Martinez. And it's really great to have you here and tell us a little bit about your experience as a commercial performer. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, so I think a little bit of a journey, a little bit of my story and my journey as a dancer, I would say kind of being bicoastal in New York and LA, um, there's really no blueprint. I think everyone is an artist and everyone kind of has to create their own path for themselves. I do think that especially, um, as a dancer, you want to think of yourself as an entrepreneur and as a brand. So something that, especially nowadays, um, it is very, e it is a lot easier to be able to control that narrative, especially, but I think as a young dancer, something I, I guess I wish I would have known in my younger days um, is to 
maybe like to take a, a sort of branding class and figure out like what your brand is and how you're going to promote that essentially. Um, and also even understanding the business side of things too, especially if you're going to be with an agent, understanding and knowing that, you know, whatever job the agent essentially works for you, but you definitely have to put in the work as well. So you always have to make sure that you are constantly, um, you know, just keeping everything up to date, your headshots and your reels and, and things like that. And I think, especially with social media, it's a lot easier to kind of compile that and, you know, have your resume always on, on scene, um, essentially. Some of the, some of the best um, things that, that helped me as a dancer too is, you just always constantly have to train. I know for me, I, there was a point where I was auditioning a lot, but I wasn't booking that much. And I would always get so down on myself after it, but it was also kind of like, I wasn't training as much as I needed to be. I was just going to the auditions. And then it took me a long time to realize like, oh, it's kind of like taking a test without studying. Like, why am I not booking this job? <laughs> what because you're not picking up the choreography as fast because you have to stay sharp so I think always just training working with the choreographers that you like working with the best is super helpful I was always taking workshops and stuff with and master classes with certain choreographers when they would come in um, that's huge too um, taking and also taking classes that are outside of your comfort zone too are super is super important as a dancer being able to like definitely being trained and being technical but also um not being afraid to venture out and maybe take a class that you're not so comfortable in um so that you're a little bit more flexible and, and versatile i guess but but it is good to have specialties too and have things that you know that you're specific in because if you're going to audition and they're like okay we need flamenco dancers or we need tumblers or something like that i think that's definitely good having some sort of specialty skill that helps you stand out because there is a lot of a lot of competition out there. So finding that thing that makes you stand out definitely and not being able, not being afraid to freestyle and improvise. It's huge at auditions all the time. It's it's tricky. There's definitely um, there's definitely no, you know, like set thing, but I think those those are tips that would help too. Definitely being able to, yeah, like you know, move in a different way and improvise because you're always going to be asked to improvise and freestyle at an audition. Um, but I think too, I think especially dancers um, not putting yourself in a box too because there are other careers too. And I personally, as much as I have loved teaching, I love um, the production side of things and putting things together and um, do, that's a whole other career and skill set in itself too. So I think being familiar with the production side is it's fun because you're still a part of the project and everything too and each project is new and exciting and something you know fun to look forward to so you have to be consistent I think consistency is key too it's another thing that I learned um, throughout my dance journey is that you have to remain consistent because um, that's how that's how you'll see results faster definitely um, being consistent and having discipline you have to have tons of discipline have to have a lot of a lot of discipline too but um yeah <laughs> you feel like um in, in the commercial world do you feel like there's a timeline like a very specific timeline for dancers or do you feel like you saw still um older working professionals or have they or have they had to transition into another avenue other other than just the performing part of it yeah um, yeah, that's a great question. I really think, I really think it depends. Like there are some dancers out there, like Jessica Castro, for example, she is, she is a dancer that is booked every job under the sun. And I mean, I, I would say that she's probably definitely still booking, but she's definitely transitioned more into choreography and directing and that sort of thing. Um, I think it really, it's hard because dance is, we're kind of at a pivotal time with dance where it's a it's coming to I don't want to say a com obviously everything was at a standstill because of COVID you know but you also have dance exploding everywhere you know like all over TikTok all over social media and in all types of commercials everywhere um even though it's you have it's it's crazy how you know theater and Broadway unfortunately like company work has had to 
sort of transition or <clears throat> figure out a way to go virtual until people can go back into the theater. Um, so it seems like it's been easier for people to get more commercial work in productions. Like I have, I know a bunch of people that are still booking commercials and doing things and everything too. But um, I would say that, I don't know if there's necessarily like a cut off or age, you know, obviously there might be a dancer that's in their late thirties, but they look really young. So they're still booking and they're still, you know, physically active. And so they're still working a lot. And I think, I think it's just um, at the discretion of the dancer and what they what they want to do, whether they want to be um, the person that's the body, or if they're the person that wants to be sort of the creative behind it too, behind that lens. And I mean, yeah, like for example, like Charmaine, one of my really good friends. I mean, she didn't even graduate from high school and booked Madonna at seventeen. Has just been working constantly, 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 and now she's more. Um, choreographing but now she's also trying to be an artist too like a performance artist herself because she's always working for other people and now she wants to be the creative and do all that and she's shining and doing awesome so I think it depends I think it depends everyone kind of has their own journey and their own route and honestly sometimes it's just just luck too like some some dancers get lucky and they just book constantly over and over and over and over and then it depends too I think if sometimes if you book one job and you end up working with that director or that choreographer and they like you, then you just keep working with that person over and over and over. Like, you know, Beyonce had her same dancers, her same cohort of dancers for a really long time, you know? Um, but it was also still very competitive in that, in that world too. Or if you end up assisting a choreographer too, then you get brought on a bunch of jobs. Like that's how I was lucky. And I assisted a bunch of choreographers and I was able to help produce their shows. And they kept bringing me back on and bringing me back on and bringing me back on and developing those relationships too is big um but doing them in kind of a, a genuine way I would say not just trying to kind of climb the ladder too because um there's definitely a lot of that as well too I think you want to be genuine with who you work with um obviously you're not always going to be lucky to be in those situations because sometimes you book a job and a job is a job <laughs> but um but it is nice when you kind of find a team to work with and you're able to work with them more often. So um, that's good too. But there are, but there are, I think it's just, it depends, you know, especially with, with dance, you just have to nurture it and take care of your body because the longer you take care of your body, the longer you're gonna, the longer your career is gonna last too. But, it, but you really do have to just constantly train all the time because if use it or lose it, it's true. <laughs> It's definitely true. It is a technique and a skill that you have to always like oil the machine. You got to keep the machine oiled all, all the time to continue to work. Um, but yeah. As far as the that training, um, because you were you're saying you were primarily in New York and in LA. Is it mainly hearing from other dancers where there's really great places to train? Are there studios that you just know about or um do you just kind of go try to find some yeah I mean I think there's definitely um those known studios in the in New York in the commercial world is definitely like BDC Broadway Dance Center is one of the biggest ones Perry Dance um PMT but then a lot of other dance studios actually started to open up like EXPG is a new studio that started to open up steps on Broadway like that's definitely more kind of a uh, musical theater ballet types of training but they do have more commercial dance styles as well too and I think it's interest a lot of in in New York um in LA too a lot of choreographers too will just have their own master classes and they rent a studio and they teach their own master classes so that I know in New York, there's one studio called Ripley Greer's where choreographers would book a space and their classes would be packed. But that was a fun way to, to train too because the classes were a lot cheaper, which is nice. You know, they're, maybe, they're, maybe they're a younger choreographer that's kind of starting out that doesn't have as big as a name. So instead of $25 for a master class or, or whatever, just a class, it's, only, it's 10 bucks, it's eight bucks, it's 12 bucks. So that's, that's great too, to be able to keep your training because training is expensive and the work study programs in BDC, I know their list was, was they had a waiting list for Lord knows how long, but um, it's kind of, I think it, it's definitely, there are those known studios. And then I think the more when you're in the scene, then you start to meet other dancers and then they'll be like, oh, so-and-so is teaching a class on Wednesday at seven or, 
And also with social media and Instagram, it's a lot easier for these choreographers and dancers to promote themselves and promote their classes. So that's another way that's changed too before um, cause in LA, it was like more Landis before more Landis was millennium and edge. And I mean, movement lifestyle is an amazing studio. They closed during the pandemic, which is so sad. Cause that was such a great, I loved that. That was one of my favorite studios to train at in LA, just because it wasn't such a scene. People were there to, to train, to dance. And, it, and people weren't concerned about like, who's going to be seen in the class. It was just really about the movement, which is good. It takes that pressure. Off because now also even the even the um, especially in the commercial world the class dynamic has changed too because now it's you go you barely get a warm up you you learn a combination like ten counts of eight in a really short amount of time and basically whoever picks it up then you have the same people just doing it in groups filming it over and over and over which happens a lot now in class so personally I don't really like classes like that because you know, it's like, is this an audition or is this a film shoot or is this a class? <laughs> you know? So that's become a lot more um, popular, but that's why other studios like um, the smaller studios or even Edge too, or um, yeah, like Movement Lifestyle was great. It was such a good, the energy was just different, you know, it was just different. And the choreographers um, were their style. It was, it was about the, the technique. It wasn't about the, 30 second Instagram video at the end, mm -hmm. which is the commercial dance world has changed a lot because of that. And it's kind of, it's kind of a gift and a curse. I think it's, I think it's great that it gives dancers so much more exposure and it is a, that you are able to have your Instagram pages, like your resume essentially, and get booked on jobs, you know, which maybe normally you wouldn't have, but it's also kind of like, I don't know. It's a little, the, the way the scales are a little, like some things are great about it and some things are a little not so great about it. But I mean, I don't know. It, I think it's been wonderful and given dancers a platform that normally they wouldn't have had before. So I think that's super cool. That's awesome. Been able to, to show, um, their, showcase their talent, you know, and, and give dancers more opportunities that they probably wouldn't have had before. I think that's amazing. But I think also just keeping the, um, keeping the intention behind it sometimes gets a little lost in the, in the clout and in the, no, in the noise of it all. And the, you know, cause, cause now I think, I mean, I think that's just a bigger conversation in terms of people. And there's been studies on it too, people validating themselves and their self-worth by how many likes they have, you know, and that's a problem. <laughs> it's like, I think it's just become one giant popularity contest too. So, um, some people are naturally like insanely gifted and they can showcase their talent and it's gotten them opportunities. Like I said, they probably wouldn't have gotten before. And then other, other people you are just kind of like, why are, are you really doing this? Because, you know, what's your intention behind it? I think the, I think the genuine intention behind it has been lost a little bit. So I think that's kind of the gray area. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's another uh, career I should talk about is <laughs> like editing, <laughs> you know, that's probably a very, 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 Oh yeah. Uh, very pro possible career that's going to be coming out a lot for and especially dance it takes a creative it definitely takes a creative uh view and mind to be able to do that so editing video production there's also like content creators too that they get paid for that too like that's a whole another career option there's so many ways to still fuse the creativity you know with still being an artist but still have it be like a career path too because it's hard like some dancers are going to book and book and book and they'll have they'll be lucky that they'll have that and some dancers don't but that doesn't mean I mean we've all had those moments where we feel discouraged like oh why didn't I book that job you know but there are ways to be able to still you know use that creativity but yeah video production is huge that's a skill definitely I'm working with an editor right now and he's a dancer and so he gets it. I was like, okay, this 13 second clip, you can use the whole clip or just give me a solid eight count. And he understands what that means. <laughs> so, yeah, like knowing your musicality, being able to envision that, um, directing, choreographing, producing, there's all, there's all types of avenues, but it's definitely, there are, I mean, I think there's choices too, like whether you wanna be a freelancer or whether that's why always having some sort of, um, teaching job on the side is nice for that stability, but then 
also find that's why I've always taught. Um, I have taught full time, but I like teaching part time because it gives me I still have that stability of my teaching job and I still get to work with my students and see them flourish. But then I have time to myself to work on creative projects and things like that. And that's super important to me as well, too. So finding that balance, I think finding that balance is important as a dancer, as an artist, as an adult. <laughs> <laughs> finding the balance um, to still do, you know, fitting, getting the time to squeeze in everything you want in the day, but still being able to support yourself as someone being creative. Like that's, that is always the toss up and it is, it is hard. You know, you're probably going to have to gig and you're probably going to have to have more than one job and you might not always have the most traditional road, but, um, and that's okay. Or either if you want to go more traditional, that's totally fine or be a little more unconventional. And I had at one point, I had like five different jobs and I was in my twenties. I don't know if I could do that right now. So, <laughs> so much, but yeah, it was just like the dance life, just gigging, going from gig to gig and also corporate events too. Like they're always hiring dancers and things like that. Like I knew a bunch of dancers in New York, they used to do that huge corporate events. It'll be a while till those come back, but, um, yeah, cruise ships. There's, there's definitely, there's, there's work out there, but you also have to be, it's not for the faint. Of <laughs> you have to be, you know, you have to have some grit and you can't get discouraged easily. You have to just keep, you have to have a tough skin. You know, you're not, you're not going to book every job. You're not going to get along with everyone all the time. It's hot, you know, it's okay. But just knowing that and finding the strength within that to keep going to and also having a strong understanding of who you are as an artist and a person and not just following the latest trend or not just like doing this because everyone else is doing that um, you know so not every dance challenge is for every single person <laughs> and I'm sure that's part of the branding class that you're talking about right is really knowing like no don't put everything on Instagram <laughs> like take a look at it see does it look good does it not look good <laughs> I think definitely I, I, something I wish I would have had in my training more so too that I didn't really, yeah, like some sort of like branding or marketing class, like a branding, a marketing class, figuring out your package, especially if you're a dancer and you're auditioning, you know, who are you as a brand and how are you going to, you have to sell yourself, you know, ideally um, there's definitely, you're going to have to be like flexible and sort of move along with it too. But yeah, I think always just constantly educating, not only training, but just educating yourself as a dancer and a, and a business person too. Because I think, I think that's something that's hard for dancers is that we're so creative, but then we don't really have the business knack. So having a stronger understanding of that too, how to negotiate contracts, how to know your worth, how to know what your rate should be, because you are going to be taking a lot of jobs on odd end jobs and it is going to be kind of like a, from a gig to gig project to project sort of thing. So understanding what dancers Alliance rates means and not just taking any job just to take it because you want to be seen, you know, like having, having some sort of a standard too and a precedent that you set, you know, like, no, I'm not going to take this music video for a hundred bucks that rehearses for 10 hours like just because I mean I think it, it depends it depends whether it, it's a passion project and you want to work with those people and they don't have a budget and you're doing it because you want to because there's going to be a lot of those jobs too but then also not to fall for being taken advantage of because dancers are constantly getting the bottom of the barrel all the time so being selective I think being selective and knowing ahead of time like okay I'm going to do this this project and I'm not getting paid for it, but I'm doing it because I want to do it. And I want to work with this choreographer and I want to work with this group of people. And this is just, this is just for fun. Like, this is just a passion project. Okay. This is just for the YouTube channel or whatever. And, and knowing the difference in deciphering, but there are certain contracts. Like if you book, a, I think a union music video, I forget what the dancers Alliance rates are now, but I believe it's like minimum $500 a day or some, something like that. So just knowing that too, I think knowing your worth as an artist and as a dancer is, is big and um, it's hard to kind of turn those jobs down sometimes or not do something to stand up for your value and what you know is right. But I think it's hard. It's, it's, you know, people, they want it so bad that they'll just kind of like do anything. So I think being selective and being true to who you are as an artist is huge. And that's a huge part of the longevity aspect too and, and kind of knowing when to 
<clears throat> you know, which jobs to take and to turn down and which jobs to not. And so, um, yeah, it's a, it definitely, it depends. It's a roller coaster. But um, also I think knowing too that it ebbs and flows. Like there's sometimes where you're going to be working a ton and sometimes when you're not, especially when you're just freelancing and going from one job to the next. So that's the other thing too. So, <clears throat> you know, obviously right now it's, things are, you know, dancers are looking for opportunities, but it'll, it'll, things will, are definitely going to start opening up and things are going to get back on track. So um, that's a big, that's a big lesson I have to learn throughout um, dance life. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I feel like um, as a younger dancer starting out, it's still okay to be selective or do you feel like when you're starting, take what you can take and then start getting more selective or do you feel like no you should really start at the beginning because you want to make sure that you know you're also not compromising right from the beginning right um i think i think it depends honestly i mean as a younger dancer it is a little hard because a lot of these things yeah you just learn from experience right um so i definitely I definitely think that as a younger dancer, definitely stay curious and stay hungry, but don't compromise your self-worth or your value, you know, like just because everyone's doing the up challenge doesn't mean you have to do it too. <laughs> or like, I don't know, for me as a commercial dancer, something that was really hard, especially as a technically trained dancer was like, I don't want to go to this audition it with booty shorts, like crumping the floor. Like that's just not the type of dancer that I am. That's not who I am. I know I'm not going to army crawl on the floor with six and six inch heels on. That's just not, and you're going to get a lot of that in the commercial dance world. And, you know, do, am I going to show up half naked to this audition or am I going to, I'm like, am I going to call out for, those are the choices that you have to make as a young dancer too. It's like, am I going to call out for work to go to this audition where girls are literally completely not all auditions are like that definitely not but there are a lot that do that so those are the choices that you're going to make like are you going to skip class to go to you know be in this whatever sort of project or are you going to just hold off and wait to be in something that's you know and work with a choreographer that you know is really an artist too so those are those are the tough choices too i think as a commercial dancer yeah i really had to draw the line with certain things like that too it's like no i'm not gonna I'm not going to, you know, show up half naked to not an audition. That's just not me. So, but that doesn't mean that there's not work out there for me as a commercial dancer. It doesn't mean, you know, and then if there's, if you know that there's a certain artist that choreographs or maybe, or someone that like you want to work with then get in their classes and start taking their classes all the time. And then like start taking, there's so many choreographers that have so many training programs too, which are amazing. Also, also try to get in their training programs if you can. Um, which is a great way to just connect too. And I think a lot of choreographers are branching out and having these types of conversations where it's not just dance, like they're really talking about um, longevity in your career as a dancer. Like one of my friends, Gigi Torres, I took one of her training programs and she's awesome for doing that. And like had the same sort of struggles that I did, you know, like she's all about empowering women and building communities. And in the commercial dance world, it's hard to find that a lot, mm -hmm. it is out there because there definitely is a community out there but you kind of have to like find your niche and also a huge thing that I definitely wish I would have learned too is to not compare yourself to someone else's journey too so everyone and I think that we're definitely in this digital era where you see other people's lives constantly in front of you all the time that you need to be like okay that's cool she booked Janet <laughs> so, this person's been on tour with so-and-so forever that's all right. Then that job wasn't meant for me or just like or that, you know, <clears throat> not, I think that's big, especially for a younger generation. And I wish someone would have kind of like instilled that into my brain younger when I was younger, but um, I'm in the millennial era, but anyway, I think not as much as you might think that you're at, you know, maybe at a similar level as someone else too. like, don't compare your journeys to theirs. Don't compare yourself to someone else that's huge. Everyone has their own destination, their own road, their own path. And the more work that you put in, then you're going to reap those, those benefits. If you put the work in, and that's also too, I've seen a lot of dancers that just because they're super talented, they have a terrible attitude. So they don't book 
for someone else who's more like the underdog. Maybe you don't, they don't have the best technique or they're not the best dancer, but they have so much passion and they show up and they put the work in and they get just as far as not further than the other dancer. So I think that's a, that's a big thing too, is when you're on set and you're, and you do book a job, you need to be very careful about how you act around the director and the producers and the people on set booking you because they don't like you. You're not going to get called back again. You know? So that's the other thing too. It's like how you interact when you're on a job and you're on a set or you're on stage, you have to be professional. That's your job. You can't be like on your phone or chit chatting with someone in the corner. Like you need to take it seriously. You need to like buckle up and focus and do that. And so you're, there's definitely a like protocol of how you act when you're doing a show, when you're on a job, when you're doing anything like that, like how you act in the dressing room, how you act, how you treat the crew, how you treat, you know, the people on set. That's major, it's major, you know, like definitely do it, but <clears throat> You know, if you're going to be a diva, that's great. Do it, own it, but be respectful too. Cause I've been on sets with a lot of people that are sometimes just like disrespectful and it's, and it's, um, distracting and it brings the energy on the set down. And you're just kind of like, Oh, <laughs> this is awkward, but, <laughs> um, yeah, I think too, I think just like definitely explore as a young dancer and work with different choreographers and work with and, and, to, and take those projects, you know, obviously you're not going to get paid for everything right away, but also, but knowing that and being still, still being smart, I think, like definitely going for it and putting yourself out there. Um, but also it's okay to be selective too, I would say. Definitely it's okay to be selective and you don't have to feel like, I know as a young dancer too, you're like, I gotta be here. I gotta be there. I gotta train with this person. I gotta be in class. I gotta do that all the time. And, and it's, it's a little bit of a rat race sort of feeling. Um, but it's, it's, it's okay to take a step back and like slow down a little bit sometimes too. I know as a young dancer, you know, we're hungry and we want it and we want it, like we'll do anything for it. But I think too, just the, sometimes the pauses are okay. You know, sometimes the no's work in your favor and that's okay too, you know? And I think learning that and being, being okay, like with the stops along the way, it's part of the journey. No, I actually love that you're saying like that the the nose that the nose may be very important. So mm -hmm. don't get bogged down in the idea that it's a no. It may right. be the pause that you couldn't personally take that mm -hmm. life said, no, hold on. You don't need this job. You can't take this job or whatever. So I mean I think that's a great way of uh, a great perspective for for that. Yeah. And it's hard because sometimes, I mean, we're in, in this business, you're going to get, there's going to be rejection along the way, a lot of rejection and it's hard. And it's like, I've done that so many times where I've gone to so many auditions and I would just get so down on myself. Like, God, I can't even believe I didn't even make the first cut, but then, you know, the, pl the plug gets pulled on that project anyway. Or, I mean, this one, I remember I did this one, I auditioned for this one new year's Eve job and it was for like this big, I don't know, the choreographer, it was like this big New Year's, New Year's Eve party in DC or something. And so I went and I made it like all the way to the end to this audition. And it's funny because I'd always go to this audition, this one girl, her name is Katie Martinez with a K, Christina Martinez. So we were always like bookends and we kind of looked similar and we would always be at the same auditions and we'd always like, you know, the Latin girls would be at this audition. And so, and we kind of danced similarly too. And so, but she would always get the job over me all the time. And I'd be like, ah, but she's, she, you know, we're friends too. So anyway, so she ends up booking this job and I was so upset. And I was like, guys, just made it towards the end. Like I should have totally gotten that gig. Come to find out that they do the job and the choreographer is kind of a jerk. They end up leaving one of the girls stranded out, like just left her in Washington, DC. Uh, where like from the bus. I don't know if she missed the bus or whatever happened. Long story short, I heard they just like left her. And I was like, oh my God, what if I was that girl that got stranded in DC after the job, you know? So, I, I mean, I heard that they did the gig or whatever it was, but it, the experience ended up being terrible. So I was like, okay, well, maybe it's actually a good thing. I didn't book it then. That's fine. <laughs> what if I was the girl that missed the bus, you know? Oh no. <laughs> stranded on New Year's day. Like that's terrible. What a terrible way to start your New Year's. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's interesting. I think just also, yeah, not, and it, and it's hard, especially as, as dancers, like we're very passionate people 
not to get emotionally attached. If you get, if you don't make the cut, then that's fine. Then go, then keep training. Just keep training, keep auditioning. You'll book, the, you, maybe you won't book the next one, but a job that's more fitting for you will be, will be out there, you know? And being okay with that. Like, it took me a long time to not get emotionally attached to, because the auditioning comes with the territory, you know? If you book every job, good for you. That's awesome. There are some dancers out there that you're like, man, this person's booking constantly all the time. That's cool. But it's okay. If you don't get it, then just on to the next, just keep it moving. You got to just like, keep it going, keep it going and not, not getting so down on yourself. If you don't make the cut, I think, yeah, it had took me a long time to like, not be so emotionally attached to it. So could you tell me a little bit about like what sort of a day would be like, um, whether it's a sort of an audition day or whether it's a day that you've actually booked a job? Yeah, so so when I was in New York, I a lot of the auditions were, um, I was usually like in the morning times I would find, I mean, it depends, they're all over the place, but I um, a typical day would be, if I had an audition or a casting, there's a couple of times where I'd have a couple of castings throughout the day, but um, I would, I would get up if I was really good. I would get go to the gym if I had time, like really get it in. But that didn't happen all the time. But I would just get my, um, my bag ready, my outfit, my, like just like whatever outfits. Always have backups too when you're going to auditions. Like bring a couple things, just in case you never know. I remember there was one day that. This was actually a really crazy day. I was assisting a choreographer. We were doing a music video for this artist. And then I was assisting Kevin Marr. Um, and this is kind of crazy how the how the dance world is too. I had never worked with him before or assisted him, but boom, um, I, this was a little weird. I was assisting the choreographer, but I still had to audition to be in the commercial too. It was very, very strange. This is also how the dance world is very unconventional too. So I was there and I was, the girl checking in, taking everyone's headshots and giving them their numbers. And then I was also in front, assisting the choreographer, running the music, doing everything with him. And then they're like, okay, number 75. And they're like, wait, but you're, aren't you assistant and you have to audition? <laughs> I was like, I don't know, this is weird. <laughs> so like audition for the commercial that I was already assisting. That was weird. And then ended up going to lunch with the girl who's like the, with the crew. Cause I was with the choreographer, with the director, with the artist. So I was still there and then rehearsed with her all day for like four hours after, which was really intense. But long story short, I just remember I was, I had the same clothes on from the audition, like all day into the rehearsal. So by the end, I was just feeling really disgusting. So just make sure, making sure he was at backups, no, never know. Um, anyway, that was one day that wasn't your typical day. Um, but usually I would go to whatever castings I would have in the morning and auditions are, it's weird. Like sometimes they can run really smoothly and they'll have you in and out. And sometimes they don't, sometimes you'll be in a holding room forever too. So that's the other thing too, is being patient. Um, so I'd go to the audition and then stop, have lunch somewhere. And then that's when I worked in the after-school program. And then I would work in the afternoons and the evenings um, and then whatever events and stuff I would do or rehearsals or, yeah, it was a little all over the place. So every day was a little, was a little different. Um, but that, I would say typically that would be something. And then sometimes in New York too, they would have castings that were really easy, like in and out. You would just go in, you would do probably like a self-tape I mean, I'm sure now it's all digital too. You can just do it from home, but you would go to a different studio, sign in, do a self tape, do whatever the camera test in front of the director. And then that would be it. So sometimes you can go to a few castings within a day. In New York, I feel like it's a little easier because you can get around easier. In LA, it's a little hard with traffic to get from one spot to the next, but it is possible. It definitely is possible. Um, but yeah, it really, I mean, some days would be more full than others. Or I mean, it would be like, auditions in the morning, work in the, in the afternoon, evening, and like rehearse at night for whatever was going on at the time where, yeah, that would be a day. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then what would like a, a day that you had booked a job be like? Um, so when I booked Radio City, that was awesome. That was such a, we had, did, what was the Craig Craig Ferguson, the comedian, he had a, he had a live show at Radio City and he did like a, 
it was a Halloween show. So we were like the vampire rockets. So we did the whole like rocket line and everything. Um, that was a super fun day. So usually what would happen for that show in particular, <clears throat> we had rehearsal, we had tech the night before, which was, I think it went pretty late that day. And then it depends. Usually, usually we'll have like a tech rehearsal or a run through or something um, before. And then you'll get a little bit of a break and then you'll come back and then it's showtime necessarily for that gig in particular. I remember we had one really, really long rehearsal day because it was a quick turnaround. So we had one, I think just like one full eight hour rehearsal. It was like an all day rehearsal. And then um, we went to the theater and then we had a tech rehearsal, a dress rehearsal, and then had a little bit of a break, come back to the theater and then do the show. So that was just for that. And I think also for like, for a lot of Broadway um, dancers and stuff too, it'd be kind of similar. Like you would have your rehearsal days, you would have basically some, whatever notes you would have to do um, and then come back to the theater, like go about your day, go to the gym, take a class, whatever you wanna do, have lunch, come back. Sometimes they take a nap, go over the notes and then do the show. So yeah, it depends, but um, yeah, for a video shoot too, thinks usually it's, you just like rehearse um, as much as possible. And then usually like you're rehearsing and even it depends, like if it's a quick gig and you just learn the choreography, sometimes you're still rehearsing the choreography like on the side before, <laughs> before you shoot to so make sure you still remember it. Um, and then shoot, and then it depends. I mean, a lot of it is hurry up and wait too. Oh, it's a lot of hurry up and wait. Go, 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 go. Get there, get there, get there. Stress. Be on set for a few hours until you even shoot. Shoot. Okay, stop. Cut. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Okay, shoot. Okay, no. <laughs> so, it depends. A lot of people have different styles and ways of working too. So you kind of just have to be flexible. Like some directors are really on it, have it together. Other directors will decide last minute that they don't want to do that anymore. It's not fitting. And so just kind of being like flexible with that too. But if it's a shoot, usually you're on set for hours. Yeah. You have to make sure that you're staying warm and not um, kind of getting yourself, you know, into a spot where, nope, I'm not ready. <laughs> yeah, I did a, I did a performance for, it was like a Super Bowl after party and we were, it was, yeah, it was freezing because it was a Super Bowl. So it was like January, February. And so we had a set and then we had a holding tent, but it was outside. So you're freezing <laughs> like in your costume. And then it was like back and forth and back and forth and it was raining and they had to like transport us back and forth. <laughs> but Beyonce performed, so it was cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I just remember there were so many dancers on that job or a lot of dancers, but it was fun too. But also, yeah, like being able to be, yeah, just flexible too. Like if you're, if they're gonna move you to one stage to go to another stage, like you just gotta just, just do it. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like you, you kind of came up with your own system in terms of keeping yourself, your body kind of ready for throwing yourself back on? Or do you feel like it just kind of was like, nope, I'm young, so I can just do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I taken yeah better yeah the the <laughs> I took advantage of my youth. <laughs> and with some of the like when I would do carnival and stuff in LA, for example, yeah, one of my friends I would be like doing like plies and tondus in the corner, and you know my friend Salima would be like, oh, you're definitely a classically trained dancer. I was like, you don't see any of these dancers warming up in the corner. <laughs> like, and some dancers do that. Some dancers can be able to just go on stage and just kill it and other dance, you know, I need a little more rehearsal time. I need a little more, like, I need to get in the zone before I can't just, some, some dancers just go out there and like from zero to a hundred, it's insane. Others, you know, others process differently too. And I think being okay, like, no, like not beating yourself up if you don't get all the choreography at first. Like, if, I think my, something that I've noticed too is my memory. When I was young, I'd be able to remember everything, like all different types of parts, remember all this choreography. And now in my elder years, I'm like, wait, what's that eight count again? <laughs> That's another thing too, not being able to remember everything. Yeah. 
So that's that's big too. Well, now you have phones, you can be able to record everything and in, in rehearsals. So that's a major help. That helps a lot. Yeah, but also is that a crutch? Does does that wind up making it harder for people because when they when you can't like oh yeah what am I supposed to do right? Mm, I don't well, know. Learn, having that class at Loxa, learning all the choreography off the videos. Thank you for <laughs> teaching that class. <laughs> <laughs> because that was a huge tool to use definitely to be able to learn stuff off the video and be able to think, well, yeah. Did you have an agent um, throughout your whole time or were you just kind of finding things as you went? Um, I had an agent in New York um, and LA for a good three or four years. And then when I started going more into event production, um, I definitely, I got dropped from MSA, but it's okay. It was, it was fine because I definitely, I wasn't putting in the work as a dancer on my end because my career had kind of taken a little bit of a shift, um, which I was okay with. I mean, like I was, I knew it was coming because especially like, I think what, what dancers need to understand too, is that as much as your agent works for you, like, yeah, you need to be putting in the work and you need to be always having material, you know, like you need to make sure that you always have your photos ready and also that your headshot actually looks like you at the moment, you know what I mean? Like if you change, yeah, if you're gonna dye your hair, then think about that. If you're gonna, if you wanna switch up your look and you do your headshots, then, you know, that's definitely something to consider as well. Um, but in New York, I think I definitely got sent out a lot more because the commercial dance world was smaller. It was a smaller niche of people. But in LA, it was, I was just kind of getting sent to like the cattle call auditions, you know, like, okay, Paula Abdul is having a Vegas residency or Janet's going, you know, having her Vegas residency or like the big, big, big jobs that pretty much like cattle call. I didn't feel like I was getting as much individualized attention, but you also just have to be on them too. It's a cat and mouse. It's a game, you know, like, so some dancers that are booking all the time, like they, it's all about the relationships that they have with their agents too. So that's big. So I was like, I don't really have time to be chasing people. So, <laughs> so it, was, it was, yeah, I mean, I kind of felt my career sort of going in a different direction anyway, and that was fine. Um, so, but I did have an agent in New York for the majority of the time that I was out there, which was, which was great. And I had a really great relationship with them. Um, so that was, that was fun. It was a lot of fun. And there was just so many, I mean, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's definitely, it's, it can be a little bit of a, I think too, it's, it might be nicer, um, maybe for the younger dancers to start off with a smaller agency so that you stand out more and you get more, um, I don't want to say attention, but more opportunities or that you're able to, like, I'm actually thinking of maybe re-signing with another agency up here, um, which is cool. And just, and it is, it looks, seems like a little bit smaller and more of a, you know, community type of thing, because it's hard. It's a very, very competitive world out there. And there's so many people out there. So when you find a smaller agency, um, I think that helps too, than ones that are so saturated with like thousands of dancers, you know, then it's going to be, it's going to be hard to get booked basically. So, yeah. Do you That's feel like it. having an agent um, is a really important part of being in the commercial world, or do you feel like you can do it without? Um, Yes and no. Honestly, I, I think at this, in this day and age, you don't really necessarily need an agent, to be honest. And also like, even as a singer, you don't really necessarily need to be assigned to a record label anymore. And I think that's the power of social media too, is that you can get booked on your own. And it depends. Cause even like a lot, what I was noticing too, is a lot of the jobs that they were sending me on, you had to have a certain amount of following before they would even, they would even send you out to the, to get to the audition in the first place. Mm. Yeah. So that was, that's interesting too. <laughs> okay. So I think that those are the things where you start to just be like, okay, you, 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 you get a little more familiar with like what you're going to put up with and what you're not. And I think that probably just comes when you're older too. That definitely comes as you've gone through it a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I really don't, you don't necessarily don't always need an agent. You really don't because nine times out of 10, you're putting in more of the work also too even though they do work for you, like you're the one that's putting yourself out there all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so, but you know, it's not totally necessary. 
like you can definitely find your own path. And I, I, I would get jobs on my own, even with an agent all the time, all the time. Yeah. A lot of the time, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Well, thank you again, Christina, for joining us. And we really appreciate all that you had as input. It's so important to hear sort of some ideas about it. Um, I think it's great because especially as a commercial performing artist, there's so many different avenues that you can, you can take. And so it was really great to hear both your experience and some ideas on how you can further your yourself in, in this profession and realizing that you absolutely can make a life out of it, or you can have it be for a very short period of time and then you can either leave it or return to it. Um, so thank you so much for all that really great information. Join us next time on Career Paths and a Social Awareness for the Dancer on the next Career in Dance, which is about being a theme park performer or choreographer. <laughs>